All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us for our next um, our next series called Lawlessness, the Devil's Deception. That's Lawlessness, the Devil's Deception. Now, in this series, we're going to address or answer the question, are the Most High's laws done away with? That's, are the laws of the Most High, Yah, done away with? Now, and to answer this question, we're going to use the whole book of Galatians. So we're going to read each chapter, of course, starting with chapter one, reading all the way through, and we're going to answer the question of, are Yah's laws done away with? Because, of course, that's a, a debate that has raged and gone on for, for a long time, right? And you have those that would say that Yah's laws are, are done away with and we should no longer keep them. However, um, there are those of us that believe that Yah's laws are still relevant today. All right. So with that in mind, let's um, let's go ahead and get started because we have quite a bit of, um, of ground to cover in this lesson. Uh, just a, a bit of uh, administration here. Uh, just... We're going to, we may, of course, we can't go through the whole book of Galatians in one sitting. Um, so we're going to break it up into several, multiple videos. Um, I believe this video will be at the, in, the intro, and then we'll, uh, the second video will get rolling or get started into the book of Galatians. But for the, the intro video, um, in particular this video, we're going to just cover a few things. One is, we're going to touch on some of the common um, phrases that, are out there today that whenever you know church folks have a tendency of of um, we call it um, doing quotes from the from the Bible you know these are some of the quotes that you'll see from time to time and I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of review these because these are quotes that actually believe it or not that deal or refer to the law and um, but most folks don't know about it right so let's uh, let's review a, a few common church phrases that refer to the law that we may not know that it refers to the law, okay? All right, so the first one up is Proverbs 4, verse 7. It's Proverbs 4, verse 7, and it reads, With all thy getting, get understanding. It's with all thy getting, get understanding. Now, you may have heard this um, this quote. I mean, it's one of the more, more popular quotes, but... Uh, let's take a look at this quote in the uh, in our Bible. So I'm going to go over to I'm going to switch screens. Going to exit out of the presentation. So I'm going to go over to Proverbs four verse seven. So bear with me here. So four verse seven. There we go. All right. And so we'll start off with verse seven, which says, "Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding." Okay, so but however, let's start with um, let's start with verse verse one and read down. So it says, "Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law." Let's read that again. It says, "For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law." For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved, beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Let's read that again. It says, Let thine heart retain my words. All right, so we're getting ready to, to uh, learn what Yah's words are. And they are what? Keep my commandments and live. All right, so that's a good uh, verse to understand. What are the words of the Most High? Amen. All right, so let's go on to verse 5. It says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. All right. So at least with uh, with Proverbs verse four, you can see that it actually refers to the law. You know, we actually uh, do sound bites from from Proverbs, but it and it actually refers to the law. Believe it or not. 
All right, so let's go over to our next uh, common church phrase, and that has to do with lean not unto thine own understanding. So um, this is, comes from Proverbs 3, verse 5. Now let's see how this, this verse actually ties in to the law as well. Okay, so that's Proverbs 3, in verse 5, which says, Lean not unto thine own understanding. All right, so I'm going to switch out of here. Out of the uh, the presentation mode, just give me a few minutes here, and let me pull up Proverbs three and verse five. All right, so my laptop's taking a bit of a break here. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it to exit out of there. Hang on. All right, there we go. We got it to come back. All right, so Proverbs three. All right, and let's see. That's three verse five. All right, three verse five. So let's see how Proverbs 3, verse 5 ties into the law. This is another sound bite that, um, that you also find in Christian churches, but you know, they may not, know, may not know that it ties into the law. It says, let's, well, let's start with verse 5. Trust in Yah with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. All right, so if someone comes up to you and says, Brother, lean not unto thine own understanding, and then they turn around and tell you to break the Most High's laws. Well, you take them to, to, to uh, verse 1 and read down, and it says, if we start with verse 1, it says, My son, forget not my law. <laughs> Let's read that again. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. You get it? But let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee oh hallelujah so the commandments the laws if you keep his commandments what happens L length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee let not mercy and truth forsake thee and just side note here we were in this uh series we're going to read about truth because not a lot of people know what truth is according to the to the scriptures but let's keep reading it says bind them about about thy neck write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find favor in good understanding in the sight of yah in men here we go verse five trust not in in yah or say i'm sorry trust in yah trust in yah with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. So it says, lean not unto thine own understanding. So let's do this. Let's take a look at what the, the scriptures have to say about understanding. It says, lean not unto thine own understanding. And to do that, let's start off with Psalms 111, verse 10, I believe. So let's go to Psalms 111, verse 10, to read about understanding. So it says, uh, Proverbs 3, verse, uh, verse 7, I'm sorry, Pro Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, lean not unto thine own understanding. So let's hop over to Psalms 11, verse 10, and it says, the fear of Yah is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that, what, do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Hallelujah. All right, so uh, Proverbs 111, verse 10 says, A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. All right, so we're learning about what understanding means. All right, so let's also look at Psalms 78, verse 1. All right, to get uh, some additional, um, read some additional scriptures about understanding. All right, Psalm 78, verse 1, and let's read about understanding. And it says, let's start at verse 1, and it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. <laughs> Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. All right, so hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here, right? But let's say, it, start with 1 again. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to to the words of my mouth. And just I want to point out that these that the law 
are the words of the Most High's mouth. They're the words of the Most High's mouth. And it says, verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. And that's, unfortunately, that's what we're doing in some of these Christian churches today. We're hiding the words of the Most High from Yah's children when we tell them not to keep the commandments of the Most High. All right, so let's keep reading. Number verse 4 it says, We will not hide them from our children, showing to the generation to come the praises of Yah and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. It says, verse 5, for he has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. All right. Verse six, that the generation to come might know them. Even the children should be born who should raise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in Yah and not forget the works of Yah. But what? But keep his commandments. All right. So you see, the, hopefully you're seeing the pattern here in the, import, the importance of keeping the commandments of the Most High. All right. But we're not done yet. Let's go all the way back, all the way back to Psalms 1, verse 1. We're going to read a little bit of Psalms 1, verse 1. And it reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh oh, now this verse should sound familiar because actually, this verse is also a soundbite that people also soundbite um, from the Bible. But they don't know that this, this, uh, you know, these verses actually refer to the law, right? So let's let's read about it. Or let's look at it ourselves. All right, uh, Psalms one verse one. It says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of, of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of Yah. And his law doth he meditate day and night. Let's read that again. It says, but his delight is in the law of Yah. And his law doth he meditate day and night. All right. So here you can see that these this verse actually refers to the law or discusses the, the importance of keeping the law, the laws of the most high. All right. OK. All right. So for time's sake, I'm going to try to pick up the pace here, but I don't want to lose people. So uh, if I have to, I think what we're going to do, like I said, we'll we'll make this an introduction an, an introduction into keeping Yah's laws. And then uh, video two, what we'll do is that video two will actually start uh, reading through the book of Galatians, all right? And we'll point out along the way, we'll, we'll discover together along the way whether or not we should keep Yah's laws according to the book of Galatians, all right? Okay, all right, so let's go to our uh, third bullet point here where it says, um, and this is uh, Psalms 19, verse 14. Now, this is one that um, I can tell you just from experience that this is read at the benediction. Oops, let me go back here. This is read at the benediction of um, World Changers Church. Uh, I used to be a, a member there, so I know firsthand that this was read at World Changers Church at the benediction. And sometimes after um, sitting and listening to uh, sermons on the law has been done away with or the commandments have been done away with which is once we read this you'll see that that is a hypocrisy to um, to have a whole sermon on the law has been done away with but then you close the sermon reading or quoting from Psalms 19 verse 7 or 19 verse uh, 14 so all right so Psalms 19 verse 14 you'll will read that it says let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Elohim, my strength and my redeemer. All right, so let's go and read that in the King James. So we like, just an FYI, we, we do stick with the King James. King James, which was authored or created in, in um, 1611. Uh, some of these newer Bibles, like the NIV or um, 
the New American Standard, you know, those are relatively new Bibles, you know, written in the 19th uh, century, or 1900s, I'm sorry. So yeah, we're not, not a big proponent of, of these new Bibles made from our con contemporaries, because those are, you know, furthest from the time of Christ, right? So the King James Bible was, is a little bit, a lot closer to the time of Christ than these contemporary Bibles, okay? Okay, all right, so, um, so where are we going? Oh, Psalms, uh, let's see, Psalms 19, verse 14. So Psalms 19, uh, verse 14. So bear with me. Let's get over there. All right. All right, so we got Psalms 19, verse 14 on the screen, and it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Yah, my strength and my redeemer. All right. But let's uh, let's pause, let's back up to verse eight and see how this verse ties into the law. And it says, actually, I'm sorry. Let's start with uh, verse seven. It says, verse seven, the law of Yah is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yah. Uh, is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of, of Yah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. Uh oh, now listen up. It says, and in keeping them, keeping of them, there is great reward. Hallelujah. You heard that? It says, Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. It says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression." Then it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Yah, my strength and my redeemer. All right. So we can see that this scripture, too, also refers to the, to the uh, laws and commandments of the Most High. All right. Okay. So that's Psalms, one night, I'm sorry, Psalms 19, verse 14. All right. So let's move on to our next group of uh, common church phrases, church phrases that were first to the law, uh, but that you may not know that it actually refers to the law. And the, so the next one has to do with the will of the Father. The will of the Father. And if you said the Lord's Prayer at any point in time in your life, you may be, and you may be familiar with it, and you may have memorized it, but you may not know that this actually refers to the law. Because when we say the Lord's Prayer, remember it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and it says thy kingdom come and what does it say thy will be done all right it says thy will be done all right so the question is what is the will of the father according to the bible all right so what is the will of the father according to the bible and to do that let's go to uh let's go to psalms 40. Let's see, I believe it was 8. Yeah, Psalms 40, verse 8. To read about the will of the Father according to the Bible. Not according to what we feel, think, and believe. We got to stick with what the Bible says about it, right? So let's uh, look at verse 8, and it says, I delight to do thy will, O my Yah, O my Elohim. Yea, thy law is in my heart. Let's read that again. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my Elohim. Yea, thy law is in my heart. So what is the will of the Father? His law. All right. And you, when you say the Lord's Prayer, you may not be aware that you are praying for the will, for Yah's will be done, which is his laws. All right. Okay, all right, so let's move on to our next one. And the next one has to do with the word truth. Remember, I mean, you may have heard this phrase, you know, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? It says, 
you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Well, have you ever taken the time to look up what the word truth means according to the scriptures? Or did you insert your own definition of the word truth? Well, let's look at what the word truth, according to the scriptures, means, okay? So, let's look at Psalms 119, verse 142, all right? So, bear with me a moment, because this is all the way back in the book of Psalms. Let's see, Psalms 119, and what was it, 140, was it 142? Yeah, 142, all right. So give me a moment. I have to scroll through a lot of verses here just to get to it. So 119, verse 142. There it is. All right. I'm going to pull that page up. And I'm going to scroll all the way to it. All right. Here we go. All right. Verse 119, verse 142. And so we're going here to find out what the word truth means according to the Bible. So according to the scriptures, what does the word truth mean? Like, what is it? Like, what does the Bible say truth is? And let me be specific there. It says, what does it say truth is? So, let's read it. 142. It says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth, is the truth. Let's read it again. It says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Then it says, Thy law is is the truth all right so according to um, psalms the law is the truth however let's go down to let's drop down to verse 151 and let's read see what verse 151 says it says thou art near O yah and all thy commandments are truth <laughs> did you get that it says thou art near O yah and all thy commandments are truth. All right. So in 151, we see the co that the commandments are truth. All right. So when you say, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, you have, have you owe it to yourself to find out what the word truth is. And if you do that, you'll find that it is, that, that too is referred to Yah's laws and his commandments. So and when you... You know, if you're using, you know, these um, these um, these quotes and you're trying to promote lawlessness or you're trying to promote that the Yah's laws are done away with, you know, just know that there's a bit of hypocrisy there, that you're actually reading scriptures or, or Bible verses that are speaking to the opposite of what you're promoting. OK. All right. So and then the, the last one here, I think this is the last one on the on the list. It says, uh it talks about the light. I think I had it. It says this little, little light, but actually this is referring to the light. You know, so when you say, when you've, you've heard, may have heard said uh, verses or quotes that says, you know, this little light of mine, or actually this is a phrase, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Or let your light shine. And you know, we should let our light shine. And in the, so let's go and take a look what of what the light is according to the scriptures, right? So let's look at Proverbs 6, verse 23. So Proverbs 6, verse 23. So just give me a moment to hop over there. So Proverbs 6, verse 23. And what we're going to do is we're looking for scripture, the scripture that tells us what the light is, right? And actually Christ is the light as well. You'll see have scriptures about Christ being the light. But you also have to know that Christ is Yah's word, made flesh and we read scriptures or scriptures and verses about Yah's word like his word is his law and Christ is Yah's word his law commandments made flesh right and it makes sense that Christ is the light right and why let's look at the uh, uh, the definition of light here in, in the scriptures uh, verse 23 it says for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproofs of instruction are are the way of life. All right. So let's read it again. It says, "For the commandment is a lamp." Remember that if you remember the the um, this, the uh, parable of the virgins, right, with the lamps and stuff like that, right. So keep in mind that <laughs> the, these lamps that 
these lamps are is the commandments, right? It says, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, all right? So again, you know, we're, what we're pointing out is, you know, the these laws are that the, the uh, importance of the laws are actually hidden. I mean, they're not really hidden, but they're they're in these common phrases, church phrases that you've heard, that, you, that you've heard, that we've heard, that I've heard, you know, growing up in a in a um, uh, church family. But I've heard over and over and over again. But little did we know that these common phrases referred back to the law. But now that we're reading it, now we're learning that they refer back to the law. All right. So let's keep going. All right. So that's the end of the this section regarding the common church phrase. I just thought it'd be interesting to review those just so that you know that, you know, it, some of us are being hypocrites if we're using, quote, if we're doing sound bites or quotes from these scriptures. And then, it, and then in the next breath, we're talking, we're saying that the laws have been done away with. All right. All right, so that's enough of that. Let's go to um, our next section. Now, I thought this next section would be interesting. Now, I, these are common excuses, I said, that Christian pastors use not to keep the law. So these are excuses that Christian preachers use not to keep the law. So, you know, I've, um, you know, seen videos after videos after videos of, uh, of Christian uh, preachers or pastors uh, telling their congregations that the law has been done away with, and what we're, what we will see here is that that's a very dangerous doctrine. It's a very dangerous doctrine, and that's why that, and I believe, and we believe that that's a doctrine of of the devil, of of Satan itself. And the reason why we say that is because if you remember in the garden, right, and the, you know the Most High Yah gave Adam uh, some instructions, right, and gave him his instructions: don't eat of the fruit of this tree. But Satan said, no, you don't have to do what the Most High said. In other words, he said, do the opposite. So the Most High gave Adam some laws and guidance to, to follow, right? But Satan says, no, the, <laughs> these laws are done away with. Don't do it, you know. And he had him do the opposite. So that's why we say that Satan is the author of lawlessness, right? All right, but let's look at this. So let's look. These are the most the common excuses that Christian preachers use not to keep the law. Uh, these are... Excuses that you'll, if you're having a discussion with someone that believes that the laws are done away with, these are excuses that, more than likely, they'll pull up one or two of these of these um, of these verses or these excuses, uh, because what you'll find is that the same ones, the same excuses are given over and over and over again, and um, and the hope is that in this video you'll see that w that we're that those excuses are easily refuted, just using the scripture, right? And not to, you know, belabor the point, but let's look at the first one. And you may have heard this. It says, you know, Christ fulfilled the law. You know, Christ fulfilled um, all, you know, all the law of, of, um, of the Old Testament. So uh, we don't have to keep the law, right? But let's get a better understanding. Let's look at Luke chapter 24, verse uh, 43. And so that's Luke chapter 24. Let's see if I can get over there pretty quick. Uh, 24 verse uh, 43. All right, let's see if we can get over there. All right, and so we're going here um, because uh, we want to see what what it what's meant when it says Christ fulfilled the law or Christ fulfilled the law, right? So some would take that to mean that Christ, you know, fulfilled all the law of of, of the uh, the Old Testament. But Luke chapter 24, 24 verse 43, uh, tells us something different. It says, and he said unto them, and we're reading, um, actually, I'm sorry, we're reading uh, verse uh, 44, not 43, but verse 44. Um, and this is Christ speaking. You can see it's in red. And it says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, which I was which I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I'm sorry, I may have read that too fast, but just, let's 
key in on the word fulfill. All right, it says, and these, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled. All right, here we go. Which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. Now, what does it say? Concerning me. So the part that was fulfilled was the part that parts that was concerning Christ. Right? Not the whole thing, but the parts that were concerning Christ. So when you say that Christ fulfilled all the law of Moses, you're actually taking it out of context. Is the point. Okay? All right. So in another common argument or common point that um, you may get from you know the proponents of the law being done away with was that of course you know Paul is often quoted and often used as an excuse to not keep the law but was Paul actually truly a a, um, uh, a proponent of not keeping the laws of Moses was that what Paul was was actually saying or are we getting Paul's message confused well Let's look at Acts verse 26 verse I'm sorry Acts 26 verse 22 to hear it from Paul's mouth of what Paul was teaching All right so uh, let's look at let's go to Acts let's see 26 verse 22 all right so let me get over there Acts 26 and verse 22 I believe okay yeah 26 verse 22 all right so we're going to scroll down to 22 there we go all right so this is when paul was in front of agrippa and he's answering he's defending himself right he's defending um, himself in front of agrippa as as to what paul what is as far as the doctrine that paul taught and let's actually let's actually start at verse 19 uh, so we can get a bit of context and it says verse 19 it says whereupon O agrippa this is paul shaul he says whereupon O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly, heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to Yah and do works meet for repentance. <laughs> Let's read that again. Let's see what did Paul said. Paul say he says. Uh, he, um, throughout the coast of Judea and then to, to the Gentiles that they should what repent all right so Paul taught that they should repent and do, and do what turn to Yah to Elohim and is that it is that all Paul said is it repent and turn unto Elohim no nope, it said and do works <laughs> meet for repentance all right I want to stress that because there's a, a doctrine out there that um, that you don't do any works that you just sit there and say I believe I believe I believe I believe and that's it but as you can see here Paul is saying he wants you to he taught that you should repent and turn to Yah or turn to turn to Elohim then it says and do works right so it's more than just I believe I believe I believe I believe all right but and do works meet for repentance and then verse 21, it says, For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. That's what Shaul said. All right, verse 22, it says, Having therefore obtained help, help of Yah, I continued un, unto this day witnessing, okay, listen up, pay attention, it says, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great. Here we go. Let's listen to Paul. He says, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. <laughs> Let's read that again. It says, Paul said, this is this is Paul, right? Paul saying that he said, he's saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So the point is that Paul didn't come with his own doctrine or this new doctrine. But according to Paul, he said he said none of the things in th than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. All right. So hopefully you got some understanding there. 
All right, so that's straight out of Paul's, out of Shaul's mouth. All right. Now, our next bullet point here is that I've seen pastors say this. I've seen this on a couple of videos where they say, no one can keep the law. Is that true? <laughs> is that true? Is, is that an accurate statement? When a, your pastor stands in front of your congregation and says, no one can keep the law. Is that true? Is that biblically correct? All right. And let's take a look at Luke verse 1, verse 1, to see if that is biblically correct or if that's a false statement. All right. Next, let me go into full screen mode so you can see it. All right. So uh, no one can keep the law. That's uh, another um, doctrine uh, from you know, ministers that are saying that the law is done away with. They'll say that no one can keep the law. All right. Is that true? All right, so let's start with Luke 1, verse 1, and we'll, we're going to read down. And uh, let's start with 1. It says, uh, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order to a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Verse 2, Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. All right, verse four, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. All right, now here we go. Now listen up, <laughs> and let's read verse five. Let's see, let's see what verse five says. It says, "There was." In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of, ba of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. All right, verse 6. And they were both righteous before Yah, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Elohim blameless. Let's read that again. And they were both righteous before Yah, or before, yeah, before Yah or Elohim, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Elohim blameless. So the question Let's see. Let's go back over. It says, uh, "No one can, can no you know no one can keep the law." Is that true? No, that's not true. Next time somebody tells you that, take them to Luke one verse one and read down to six. And you can actually, I mean, there's multiple people in the in the scriptures that were able to uh, keep the law. Let's let's say for instance, like Job. If you look at Job, and you're probably familiar with the with um, the book of Job, but Job one verse one. Uh, let's let's actually read that really quick. I know we have a lot of material to cover, but let's see if we can quickly read uh, uh, Job here. Let's see, Job 1, verse 1. And, all right, so that's 1, verse 1. And what, let's see, yeah, uh, Job 1, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared Yah and eschewed evil. All right? So according to Job 1, verse 1, Job was a man that was perfect and upright. Well, let's keep reading. Let's see if let's see what um, what Yah had to say about that. Uh, let's see. Let's go. To, let's drop down to verse seven, where it says, "And Yah said unto Satan, Whence camest thou?" Then Satan answered Yah and said, mm, "From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it." It says, "And then Yah said to Satan." Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth Yah and issued evil? All right. So according to Yah himself, Job was a perfect man, right? An upright man who feared Yah. So this, you know, this doctrine or this this belief that no one could keep the law. It is absolutely false doctrine, right? Absolutely false doctrine. So, um, 
make sure if, it, if uh, you have a Christian pastor that tries to bring that out in um, their teachings, you make sure you call them on that. And you take them to Luke, you can take them to Job, you can take them to Hezekiah, you can take them to some of these other prophets that shows to show them that that's a false doctrine. All right. All right, so let's keep going. Some common excuses that preachers use not to keep the law. Uh, I've seen this one uh, several times as well. Uh, they'll say, man, it's the laws. You got 600 and something laws. You know, no one can keep them, keep those 600 and something laws. And that's misleading as well because no one person has to keep 600 and something laws. It is absolutely false, right? And the reason why, well, some laws were for men, some laws were for women, some laws were for the priests, some laws were for the high priests. Some laws were, were laws that were specific to the land, some laws you have to be in the land to be able to keep, right? So when they, these Christian pastors, when these pastors toss out there that, hey, there's 600 laws that you have to keep in order to have scare you away from the laws, that's false doctrine. And the, here's the hypocrisy of it. I mean, here it is, and this video is, is made in the, you know, it's being made in the fall. It's, it's in the fall, we have football season. And I don't know if any of you out there have played football or watched football or fans of football, but do you realize how many laws or statues or commandments, so to speak, rules govern the, the game of football of the NFL? Do you, I mean, do you have any idea? Uh, we're talking about, and if you include things like player conduct off the field, uh, uh, sub, you know, substances in the, in the bloodstream. You know, he's taking these these uh, enhancement drugs, that sort of thing. Uh, the stadium, the stands, the coaching. If you add up all those laws, do you do you realize that you would have? Uh, I've seen a couple of different counts on this. Um, some folks have said three hundred and eighty something. I mean, there's there's seventeen main laws, but under those seventeen main ones are all these sub statues, right? We call them commandments and stuff like that. But if you add them up, some people have counted up to 386. Some people have went all the way up. You know, if you want to be um, nitpicky, right, and help and be very granular, um, I've seen some folks come up with 11,000 laws for the, to, that govern the, the, the whole game of football. Um, and so you, you have all these laws just for a game, just for a game of football. And so the, the comment that you get from these pastors is like, oh, man, there's 600 laws that, you know, these, these uh, law keepers have to keep. But if you think about the game of football, you probably have more for the game of football. And these players don't even think about it, right? They don't even think about it. They just go out and do it. Just go out and play this game. It's almost like walking up to a football player and saying, hey, man, you realize it's like 300 and something laws that govern the game of football? You can't keep all those laws. Man, just go ahead and turn in your jersey and quit. I mean, that's, that's too, it's too tough. You just can't do it. A football player wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do it. <laughs> what you do is, what we tell people is that you do the best you can with what you got. Let me say that again. You do the best you can with what you got um, based on where you are. I mean, you, if you're uh, aware that you're an Israelite, you know, you're living in the land of your captivity, right? So you do the best you can with what you got. And if you fall short, we have Christ to make up the difference. You dust yourself off and you go back and you try it again. And the funny thing about it is that even back during the time of Moses, those guys weren't perfect. And they, the, um, the Most High or Yah allowed for them not to be perfect because he gave them the law of animal sacrifice. And we'll read that when we go through Galatians. But these, um, these Israelites from during, at the time of Moses, they didn't have to be perfect. And they weren't expected to be perfect because they were given the laws of animal sacrifice. So when pastors come out here and try to hammer home that you know there's 600 laws out there and no one can keep it that's that's misleading right that's misleading all right so anyway the next um bullet point here has to do with you know, i've seen pastors make this try to make this point they'll, they'll say well if you offend one law you offend them all brother if you offend one you offend them all and they get that from james 2 verse 10 and then in, in this too is is a, is a uh, is misleading. So they'll say, if we go over to James two verse ten, I'm trying to get there. Let's see, James two verse ten, and they'll use that as an excuse not to keep the laws of the Most High. So let's say, um, and let's read it. it. Says verse ten, James two verse ten. It says, for who whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. 
So therefore, brother, you shouldn't keep the commandments. You can't keep. No one can keep the commandments because if you if you mess up one, you offend them all. So you might as well just just go ahead and quit. Don't even don't even try to try to keep the law. Is basically what they're saying. They want you to quit before you even start, right? But let's see if that's what this uh, second chapter of James is actually saying. Let's see if if they're taking that out of context. And to do that, we're going to read. Let's start a little bit above, you know, where you know they often do these sound bites. Uh, let's start at verse eight and read down. It says, verse eight. It says. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy brother as thyself, ye do well. He said, all right, so he's starting out by or saying that um, if you fulfill the royal law, love your brother, you're doing well if you do that, right? And it says, but if you have respect of person, you, you commit a sin and are convinced of the law as a transgression. And it says, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the law, keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, all right. So let's keep reading to see what it's talking about. It says, verse 11, it says, For he that said, do not do not commit adultery, say it also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit adult, if thou commit no adultery, yet, if thou kill, Thou art become a transgressor of the law. It means you're breaking the law. So what does James say to do? Let's keep uh, next verse. It says, "So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty." <laughs> so he's saying, "So speak ye." So not only say it, you know, say keep the law, but what it's saying? It says, "And so do." So it's telling you to do it. It's not telling you not to do it. But that's what these Christian pastors that are telling you that the law is done away with, and they come to James, they're trying to say that James is saying, don't do it. But James is saying, speak ye and so do. So this is another one that's also often misquoted, and you know, unfortunately it's taken out of context um, and in order to pr promote uh, lawlessness. All right. All right, so the next one up, up the bat, is um, Colossians 2, verse 16. All right, I've seen this one quite often. Uh, and this, this one is one that's often given as an uh, excuse of not to, why, why not to keep the, the Sabbath. And actually, I think I'm going to hold this one until we start getting into Galatians, because there's a point in Galatians where this uh, scripture becomes relevant and... Um, and we can deal with the scripture in Galatians. So let's let's put this one on the parking lot. But just know that this one is is one that's also given um, as a defense for not following the laws and the commandments and the, and the holy days of the Most High. So we're going to look at this one when we look at the um, at the Pharisees. All right. So let's put that one on the parking lot, and I'll we'll bring this one back up in the, the second video. All right. Okay. And then the, I think the last one of the last excuses is, is that. You know, once you, you've hit somebody over the head with the scriptures enough and you show them that the scriptures say contrary to what the doctrine of the church believes. Let me say that again. If you once you show people that the scriptures are, are speaking contrary to what the church doctrine says, then you also get you often get this um, this um, rebuttal. Uh, which says in the form of, hey, you're, you're making the Bible say that. Or I believe you can make the Bible say almost anything, man. You're, you're, you're making the Bible say that. Really? I mean, can you make the Bible say that the Falcons should have won the, uh, um, the Super Bowl? Can you make the Bible say that? Can you make the Bible say that uh, Trump is, uh, is a crazy president? Can you make the Bible say that? I mean, can you open, open the book up and, and read that out the Bible, you know, specifically out of the Bible? Can you make the Bible say that the Hurricane Irma is going to uh, destroy, you know, these uh, Caribbean islands? Can you make that the Bible say that? The answer is no. The Bible says what it says. What's happening is that you don't believe what the Bible says. And the out is you're making the Bible say that. So if you're, you know, these Christian pastors that get to that to that point, you know, I don't know if, if there's you're stuck. You know, you're stuck. You're stuck in your doctrine and you're not allowing the scriptures to correct you all right so let's leave that one alone um 
All right, so let's go on to our next section. So in our next section, um, this is actually to answer some questions because I've seen some Christian pastors out there that while they're trying to uh, promote lawlessness or trying to promote, um, you know, the laws done away with, they often ask, like, you know, why do the Israelites keep the Bible? Like, why even, why are they doing that? They shouldn't have to do it, right? So this section is to answer that question. So if someone asks you, you know, why, and you're, you're a follower of Torah, you're a follower of the commandments. You have, in other words, you're, you have faith in Christ, you have faith in, in Yahshua, and you're attempting to, to do the best you can to keep the laws of the Most High. And then someone asks you, you know, why you're, are you doing that? Here's the response. All right. So this is the answer to those those pastors that would ask, you know, why are, why even keep the, the laws? And so uh, up first or the, the first reason is because we love Yah or we love God. That's why we keep the commandments. We love Yah according to the way he wants to be loved, not the way that we feel that we should love him. But we, lo we love or attempt to love Yah the best we can, the way he wants to be loved. So we look at the biblical definition of loving Yah. And to do that, you'll see the first scripture here is uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse, um, I have verse 1 up there. So let me, let me give me a few moments, seconds to get over there. Sorry. So we go in 1 John chapter 5. And I have um, one up here. So we're going over there. So let's start at one to see how do we love Yah? How do we love God? Right? So verse one says, Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Christ is born of Yah. And everyone that loveth him, that begot him, or that, that I'm sorry, let me start again. It says, Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Christ is born of Yah. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Verse 2. By this we know that we love, listen, the children of Yah. How do you know that? How, so, the, the, so the point is, is, it says, by this you know that you love the children of Yah. When, and, then, and let's keep reading. It says, when we love Yah, so when you love God, and keep his commandments let's read that again by this we know that we love the children of yah when we love yah and keep his commandments and let's read verse three it says it says for this is the love of yah let's say that again so it says for this is this is the love of yah that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You get it? So this is the love of Yah when you keep his commandments. That, that is the love of Yah. And notice it says his commandments are not grievous. So some of these Christian pastors try to make the, the, uh, the laws and commandments of Yah of the most high grievous when they tell you, man, it's like 600 and something laws. You can't keep them laws, man. That's what they tell you. But the scripture says, look, Yah's commandments aren't grievous, you know. Yah, that's what the scripture says. But you know, Christian pastors some often sometimes, when they're trying to promote lawlessness, they'll they'll say they're saying what's contrary to what's written in the scriptures. All right, so the, uh, let's oh, since we're here, let's also go over to Second John, verse one. We're going to keep reading about the love of Yah. So let's go to Second John, verse one. And let's see here. Let's go over to. Uh, let's see. Let's let's drop down to verse six, where it says, "And this is love." It says, "And this is love that we walk after His commandments." Period. <laughs> Did you get that? It says, "And this is love that we walk after His commandments." How more plain can you get than that? That's so. That's love according to the, to the Bible. It says, "This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it." So, in other words, you should do it. <laughs> you should do it. And keep in mind, this is the the uh, the New Testament, right? So, this is the New Testament. So, let's go over to our to the next bullet point. Uh, why do Israelites keep the law? All right? And um, let's in the next bullet point it says. 
We keep the law because the return of Christ is tied to the awakening of the children of Israel to their true identity and turning back to the law. So if you're asking why do Israelites keep the law, well, is the third bullet point says because the return of Christ is tied to the Israelites awakening to their true identity and returning back to the laws of Yah. What do you mean? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 6. All right. So let's look at Deuteronomy 30, chapter 1 through 6. Let's see, and the question is, why do the Israelites keep the law of Yah? All right, so Deuteronomy 30, chapters 1 through 6, it talks about the children of Israel, and it talks about, let's see, what it says, verse 1, it says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations. So what it's saying is that when the Israelites are scattered among the nations, when they shall call to mind or remember these blessings and curses, whether, whether the Lord, whether... Yah, thy Elohim, hath, hath driven thee. And it says, you know, while, while they're driven or living in the lands in which they were held captives, let's read verse 2, it says, And shall return unto Yah, thy Elohim, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. <laughs> right? Let's see. Let's read it again. In verse 2, it says, and shall return unto Yah the Elohim and shall obey. That's what they should, should do. They, they shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Now listen to what it says. It says that then Yah the Elohim will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee. And this is what we're reading. It says, And will return and gather thee from all the nations from whether Yah thy Elohim has scattered thee. So this is the promise to Israel that scattered. And the children of Israel will be living in the lands in which they were carried captives. So today, if you don't know that African Americans are still living in the land in which they were once held captive. They're the only people on the face of the earth that are living in the land that, they, that they're held captive. Not just the African Americans, but the people that were part of the transatlantic slave trade and some of these other other um, slave trades that were out there. So, but not to get off topic here, but, you know, we're reading this to answer the question, why do the key, why do the Israelites adhere to the law? Well, this is Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. Uh, all down to three is is um, because the return of Christ is tied to them remembering or recalling to mind the blessings and the curses in the lands in which they were held captives and to uh, obey his voice according to what they commanded this day in Deuteronomy and um, in their children with all thy heart and with all their all thy soul is verse two going to verse three that then Yah, the Elohim, will turn thy captivity, will start to set them free, and have compassion upon thee, and do what? And will return. So this is talking about the Most High. He will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Elohim, well, the Yah, the Elohim, has scattered thee. Okay? So that's why um, the Israelites uh, return to the to the commandments, the laws and the commandments, because the return of Christ is tied to it. And you can also read this in, you know, First Kings verse uh, eight and forty-six. Let's see if we can read that really fast. First uh, Kings chapter eight and thirty-six. Let's see if we can get, get this really quick. Um, let's see, eight verse thirty-six. Okay, it says. Um, well, let's, let's start at verse 33. So this is the, the promise, one of the promises to the children of 
of Israel. So this is actually repeating what's in De Deuteronomy 30, 30, verse 1 through 6. So let, let's read in uh, starting at verse uh, 33. It says, When thy people, Israel, smitten down before thine enemies, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, you know, start uh, adhering to the law, statutes, and commandments, and confess thy name and pray, and make supplication unto thee in his house, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people, Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. And when heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray towards this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin, and what we'll read is the word sin is uh, means to, tran to transgress or break the laws, is to transgress or to break God's laws. But if they are to turn from their sins, when uh, thou afflict them, it says, Then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sins of thy servants and thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk, and give them rain upon their land, which thou hast given to the people for thine inheritance. All right. So that's actually saying the same thing that was in um, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 6. All right. And we also have uh, 2 Chronicles 6, verse, verse 36 also speaks to speaks to the same um, to the same subject so I'll we'll skip that one for now just for time's sakes we're kind of running, running a little long but in your own time you can go back and read uh, second Chronicles uh, 6 verse 36 all right so let's go to our next uh, bullet point it says why do Israelites keep the law well um, actually I think we skipped one um, why do Israelites keep the law the second bullet point uh, the lawless will get thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> Why do Israelites keep the law? Well, because we don't want to get thrown in the lake of fire. <laughs> right? Who wants to get thrown in the lake of fire? Not me. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go. So um, so let's read about let's read about the lake of fire. Alright, so let's read Matthew 13, verse 36. That's Matthew 13, verse 36. Alright, so Matthew verse 13 verse 36 and this is uh, you know, why do the Israelites keep the law right why do we um, why do we keep the law so, so let me scroll down to 36 and this is about this is Christ talking right so if anything you should pay close attention because these are these are uh, scriptures that are that are in red so we start at verse 36 it says then Yahshua sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto them, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Let's read it. Pay attention. It says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. Now listen closely. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend him are all things that offend and them which do lawlessness iniquity means lawlessness so what offends yah or what offends I'm sorry what offends yahshua or christ lawlessness and what's going to happen to these people that are doing lawlessness that are saying that the laws are done away with that they are no longer no longer um, should follow the law, statutes, and commandments of Yah. Let's read. It says, uh, verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. All right? So, verse 41, it says, 
read that again. It says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. You're reading it right in the Bible. It says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do lawlessness, and shall cast them into a fire of a furnace of fire, and shall be, and there shall be uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. All right. So that's why the Israelites follow the law because they don't want to be lawless and get thrown in a lake of fire. There you go. All right. And let's also read this. Let's read um, Matthew seven. Uh, twenty-one. Uh, yeah, Matthew seven, uh, twenty-one through twenty-four. Let's read that, and let's read about the lawlessness. Seven, twenty-one through twenty-four. Okay, there. Okay, as this is a good one. Um, so this is Christ. Uh, you know, he's giving you uh, some insight into why he's going to turn people away when they are before him. You know, why is why is he uh, sending people to the lake of fire? Uh, so Matthew seven twenty one tells us, and he says, "Now listen closely." It says, "Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven." All right. So, you know, the you may have heard. You know, some some of these pastors say that, you know, oh, just say just call on his name and you shall be saved. Call call on the name of Christ, but you shall be saved. Well, you have to keep that scripture in mind with this scripture. You know, you can't grab one and ignore the other. Right. So this scripture is telling you why Christ is throwing people into the to the lake of fire. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So not everyone that calls on the name of Christ is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he's going to tell you why. And it says, but he that doeth the will, we read about the will of the Father, he said, he that doeth the will or the law of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay? Can't get any clearer than that. It says, but everyone, uh, I'm sorry, let's read that again. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved Thou shalt enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will or the law of my Father, which is in heaven. Many shall say, this is verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Sounds like the, Christian, sounds like the church, right? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. You know, these sound like, these, these sound like church folks, right? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work lawlessness. You get it? You that work lawlessness. Now, just think about it. You see here Christ turning people away from him. You know, and it's only one thing, right? He says, he that works lawlessness. And the one thing that we see are the one reason that we see Christ turning people away from him and sending them to the lake of fire is the one thing that the Roman Christian churches are teaching you to do. The Roman Christian churches are teaching men to become lawless, to throw away the laws of the most high, to do away with it. And that's the one thing that the Christian, that the Roman Christian church teaches. However, we see that Christ is, is, um, sending people to the lake of fire because they're doing lawlessness, right? So, again, and this, is, this speaks to, to the, uh, the importance of not being lawless, you know, not throwing away the laws of the Most High. All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, so that's why, the, uh, that's why the Israelites keep the law, right? That's why the Israelites keep the law. All right, so... Um, Let's see, the last bullet, bullet point here, I think this is the last bullet. No, I have another slide here. But it says, those keeping the laws will live in the new Jerusalem. All right, so those keeping the laws uh, will live in the new Jerusalem with Christ. If you want to live with Christ, you, sh you should be keeping the law. You better be keeping the law. Or you have to keep the law to live with Christ, right? And so we know this by, let's go to Revelations 22, verse 14. 
Let's go to Revelations 22, verse 14. I'm kind of skipping some of my uh, references for time's sake, um, but you know, feel free to go and go and read these some of these yourself. But they all they're all speaking to the same to the same point, right? So Revelations 22, verse 14. And it reads, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep the sayings of the prophet. Of, oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, verse 7. Well, it's still, blessed. I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. All right? Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. All right? Jump down to 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right, or yeah, that they, that may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gate into that into the city, to that holy city. Right. So that's why we keep the commandments of Yah. It says, "Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the, have right to the tree of life." And may enter in through the gate into the city. So we want to enter through the gate to the city. So that's why we keep the commandments of the Most High. But it's going to tell you who's going to be outside. Like who's outside? For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Right? So these are the people that are breaking Yah's laws. Right? So again, that's why we the Israelites keep the laws of the Most High. All right. So let's go into our next slide here, and let's see what we have here. So why do the Israelites keep the law? It says, well, when we, it's because when we read the scriptures of Christ, like when Christ returns, we see that when Christ returns, he's enforcing the law. It's not like he's coming back and doing away with his law. No, it's quite the opposite. He's enforcing the law. So let's jump around here. Let's go to... Um, Let's start with the law first. So let's go to Isaiah uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. All right, so give me a moment to get over there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2. Let's see. Right, Isaiah chapter 2. And so we're going to read about the law. And this is when Christ comes back. And it says the word that Isaiah, yeah, one through four. All right, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yah's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Hallelujah! So when Christ comes back, He's going to establish His house in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills. All right. And all nations shall flow unto it. So this is talking about future prophecy. And many people shall go saying, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yah, and the house of the Elohim of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law <laughs> and the word of Yah from Jerusalem. All right. So when Christ comes and establishes the house of the Most High in the mountains and in the you know in the hills, and what's going to happen? He's going to um, he's he's going to give forth his law uh, from Jerusalem. So his laws his law will be given by Christ from Jerusalem. So it's not going away, right? But, you know, here we are, you know, in these uh, Roman Christian churches teaching that the laws are done away with. You know, that's um, the, the one thing that, according to uh, Matthew and Mark, the one thing that will get folks thrown in the lake of fire. It's the one thing. The one thing that gets people thrown in the lake of fire. And here is that one is the, uh, the doctrine that's being taught in these churches. And that's why I say it's a very dangerous doctrine. For people to promote that, you know, they promote that to their church congregation, to, to promote that to their families. I mean, they're literally not, you know, dooming their church congregation and their families, you know, in, in the, well, 
and their families to uh, to the lake of fire by promoting that. You know, I, it's just it's something that they just should not do. All right, so that's Isaiah chapter two. Let's uh, jump around here. Um, let's also read that in um, uh, Micah. Let's see. Let's go to Micah four. I think that's um, verse one. In Micah 4, verse 1, it says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Yah shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yah, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion in the word of Yah from Jerusalem. So there you go. Yah will be teaching the law out of Jerusalem, out of Zion when he returns. Okay. And um, I also have like Isaiah 66 in there, uh, which also talks about, um, let's grab it right quick. Let's go to Isaiah, the last uh, chapter of Isaiah uh, 66 and let's hop over there really quick uh, verse 24 and it reads um, well actually let's go up to 23 it says uh, well 20 let's go up to 22 it says for as the new heaven and the new earth which hasn't come yet right so as the new heaven and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith Yah, so shall your seed remain. Your so shall your name remain. I'm sorry, so shall your seed and your name remain. Referring to the house of Israel, says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith Yah, so shall your seed and your name remain. Referring to the house to Israel, Israel, it says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Yah. So, in other words, uh, all flesh are going to, are going to be observing the new moon and the Sabbath and the Sabbath before Yah, and. Um, Let's read 24 because this is what we're what we're trying to warn people about, right? About being um, lawless, right? About being uh, uh, teaching lawlessness out of their pulpit. Verse 24 says, "And they shall go forth and look up, or look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed, broken." And you know, the word transgress means to break break Yah's laws that transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Right? They read about the lake of fire. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So again, in Matthew, we read that the lawless are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. And then here in Isaiah, we see that that the uh, the ones that are being quenched, that will be, will, will be burned by fire, are the ones that transgressed or broke Yah's laws, right? All right. So, and then uh, last but not least, let's go over to uh, to Zechariah uh, fourteen. So we go to Zechariah, last chapter of Zechariah, and let's read um, verse sixteen through seventeen. So sixteen through seventeen, and it says, "And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem." shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Christ, right? Uh, the Yah of hosts, it says, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Look at that. So we see that the, um, the, ho that the holidays are still going to be kept when Christ comes back. So why are, are we teaching that these, that the, even the holidays, that the holy days, that are the seven holy days, that are defined in the Bible are thrown are done away with. Why are they trying to throw those into the garbage can? And instead of of observing the, those um, holidays, observe the, the holidays that were that came out of Rome.
Christmas and Easter. Why, you know, why are we trying to do that? I mean, that's an abomination, right? And to, you know, to, to this point, let's go to the next bullet point. Let's see it, you know, speaking of, speaking of these holidays or these holy days. So if you don't know, there's seven holy days that are um, in the Bible, right? Those seven holy days that the Most High has told us to keep. And what we're pointing out is the importance of these holy days um, as they pertain to Christ. Let me say that again. We're point, pointing out the, the, the importance of these holy days as they pertain to Christ. And this is also why the Israelites keep the law and the holy days, right? Um, so if you look at the list here, you'll see Passover. Um, and what and this is the Passover, the, this holy day. Why is that the Passover holy day important? Because it's important because Yahshua died on Passover, right? And then you see the, the holy day of unleavened bread. Well, what's important about the, the day of the holy day of unleavened bread? Because Christ or Yahshua was buried on unleavened bread. Right? And then you look at the, the holy day of first fruits. Well, what's important about the holy day of first fruits? Well, Christ or Yahshua was resurrected on first fruits. You get it? So you're starting to see the importance of these holy days in Christ, right? And how you're missing so much when you throw these holy days into the garbage and in turn adopt these the whole the Roman holy days. So let's let's look at the next holy days, Pentecost or Shavuot. Alright? What's so important about this this holy day? Well this was when the Holy Spirit that Christ spoke of came upon the apostles or upon the upon his uh followers, right? So each of these holy days is crucial, is very important. Uh, important. I mean, these are appointed times, right? And when we look at these seven holy days, there are still three holy days that are yet to be fulfilled by Christ, right? So, in just uh, FYI, um, you may not know that the that the holy days of trumpets. Now, trumpets was referred to as a day that no one knew the day or the hour that this holy day would occur. And the reason that, and that may sound familiar because Christ, the return of Christ is tied to, is also said to be a day when that no man, no man, no man knows the day or the, the hour that it occurs. And it's tied to the, the day of trumpets. So Christ is said to have to return on the day of trumpets that no one knows the day or the hour that that holy day occurs because it's tied to the, um, the viewing of the, of the moon over Israel. And of course, if there's overcast, overcast, then of course the moon can't be spotted, and so the um, that the holy day would not occur on that day. So it, it's purely up to the Most High as to when that holy day would occur, right? And of course, you have the Day of Atonement, right? And then we also have Tabernacles, right? So those are three holy days that are yet to be fulfilled. But if you're not observing them, you know, you're going to be lost as to what's occurring on those days, you know, and the importance of these holy days as they uh, pertain to Christ. All right, so um, let's uh, let's go ahead and in we'll call in this um, this session uh, or this video we'll call this video one uh, the introduction, and uh, hope hopefully you've, you've gotten some good information about you know you can answer questions as to why do the Israelites keep the law. Um, and you can also, uh, talk about, you know, these common phrases that, that are spoken of, you know, by the, by the church, um, and how these common phrases actually speak to the law. You know, people may not know that these common phrases speak to the law and hopefully, you know, you can also speak to some of these common, I call them common excuses that these church, these pastors are giving to break the law, right? And how, and you can speak to, um, you know, why these excuses aren't valid, right? So in our next video, we're going to get into the book of Galatians. We're going to start, of course, with chapter one. Hopefully, we can make it through chapter two. And if you if you stay with me, if you stay to, to uh, chapter at least, you know, stay through Galatians, you you will read. We're going to just read the Bible. That's all we're going to do. We're going to read the Bible, and we're going to read the precepts that go along with it, because there's parts of Galatia. That goes along with parts of Acts and parts some other parts of the Bible. So you can't read Galatians by itself, and you can't read it as you're reading a novel, or you're going to get lost. Okay, but all right. Well, thanks again uh, for watching. Uh, stay tuned for the the next uh, video in this series where we start with 
Galatians 1, verse 1. All right. Shalom.